All right. How do you want to do this? Um, I, I think it might be best if we just go over the new material first, and then we can cover some of the older stuff. Uh, probably the newer material is what you're most focused on now anyway, right? So let's look at chapter 10. Chapter 10 was all about the reactions of, and the, the properties of dyings and conjugation. Okay, so when we have multiple pi bonds in a row, can you read that? Dines and conjugation. So when you have multiple pi bonds in the row, it changes the stability, it changes the reactivity in a little bit different ways. Uh, because what we have now are uh, more able to stabilize charges, and particularly when we talk about the chemistry of double bonds, we talk a lot about carbocations, right? So if you think about dienes, okay, that are conjugated, remember this is a system where we have p orbitals all the way in a row, right? So uh, the reactivity is not of isolated double bonds. They're more stable. They get some stability from conjugation, and they also change the way groups add. So, for example, one of the main reactions we know of double bonds, right, is the addition of electrophiles. So if you take something like HBr, that will react, uh, what we know about double bonds is it could react in two ways, right? You could react the hydrogen here to give the plus charge there, or you could react the hydrogen on the end and put the plus charge there. And in fact, if it was just an isolated double bond, you would probably see a little of both, even though this is a primary carbocation, but this one is particularly stabilized, right? And it's stabilized because of resonance. So if you shift those electrons over, you can move the plus charge to the end, move the double bond in between where the two double bonds were originally. Okay, so if you add that uh, second group, the bromine, it could go one of two places. This one isn't formed because that's higher energy. These two are resonance forms. Resonance forms. Uh, so what it says is there's plus charge on two carbons. There's more plus charge on this secondary carbon than there is on the primary carbon. Uh, but in fact, the bromide could react on either. Okay. So uh, I'm running out of room. Let me erase this. So if you react the bromide on this particular resonance form, you would see you'd get this product. And if you react on here, you would get... Oh, uh, bromine, come on, that product. Okay. Which one is formed fastest? Speak up. The more substituted. The more substituted, that's right. This, this uh, more substituted one is formed the fastest. Okay, which one is most stable? The one that forms the fastest. No. <laughs> Not the one that forms the fastest. This is the uh, more stable one. Product. We're talking about the product, okay? Oh, okay? Remember, this is the difference between kinetic control of a reaction and thermodynamic control. So remember, when we talked about this with this particular example, uh, you form this intermediate, um, and the, the kinetic product is this one, um, this is the more stable because the double bond's more substituted and the bromine is less crowded, right? You can get more of that if you raise the temperature because then you allow it to reverse and go back and forth, right? So those, those terms that we use to describe that, let me just erase some of this here from my junk. Um, this is the kinetic product or the kinetically controlled one, the reaction rate, it is the lowest energy pathway to get there, not the lowest energy product. Okay, make sure you know that distinction. 
This is the thermodynamic thermodynamic product. Dynamic. Can't draw, can't write today. Okay, but nevertheless, the I think the bottom line and the and the thing you really should remember is that when you have conjugated alkene systems, that plus charge is not located on one carbon, so you could have reactions at different places. Okay, and that's important. Uh, we can control that to some extent if the one product is more stable, one product is formed faster. Uh, so I think the um, the main issues in this chapter is recognizing the fact that these allylic positions, uh, this is an, I erased it, shoot. This is an allylic carbocation, allylic carbocation adjacent to a double bond that's formed when you react with a diene. But if you can form groups uh, or charges other ways, if this was a negative charge, it'd be more stable because it's in resonance. If it's a radical, a free radical, it's more stable. Um, let's see, diens. So yeah, speaking of that stability, if we think about um, alkenes, sorry, let me know if I erase things too fast. If we think about an alkene, for example, cyclopentene, there are a number of things we can do with that. First of all, how would you take cyclopentene and synthesize cyclopentadiene from it? How would you make that? Yes. We react it with the with the halogen. You can react it with a halogen. Then that's correct we could do it this way okay and what's the stereochemistry of the two bromines opposite sides opposite sides see that product there is stereochemistry so we have to show it uh, and then we need to do two eliminations so what kind of conditions do we do elimination of halides? Yes, so something like sodium ethoxide, ET stands for ethyl in ethanol. Ah. Come on, draw. Okay, basic conditions. That's E2 elimination, right? Uh, another way to do that If we used, since it's symmetric, if we used, um, oh, let's say Br2 <coughs> or N bromosuccinamide, NBS, we could use light or peroxides. What does that do? Changes the mechanism, right? to free radical chemistry. So what happens? Which CH then undergoes halogenation? There are two kinds of hydrogens on this molecule. We have hydrogens here, and then we have hydrogens on the top. Some of those have weaker bonds than others. The positions that are allylic to the double bond are weaker. Right? The CH bonds are weaker. So when we have radical chemistry, that's where we're going to do free radical halogenation. Uh, so I'll just choose this one on the left here. So we can substitute a hydrogen for a bromine under free radical chemistry. And there we have introduced another group. We could do an elimination also from that. Again, since this ring is symmetric, it should eliminate to give a cyclopentadiene, right? Okay, so that allylic position here and here, more susceptible to free radical chemistry that you can control it. 
Um, <coughs> conjugated dienes, preparation of dienes. We could also eliminate um, under E1 elimination with uh, uh, acid catalyzed dehydration of alcohols. Okay, but I think the most important reaction that we talked about in chapter 10 is the Diels Alder cycle addition. And that's a pretty complicated reaction, right? There are a lot of details of that reaction which are important. So let's take a look. Uh, the general reaction is this. where we take a diene, which is conjugated, and a dienophile, dienophile, carry out a reaction in one step, which occurs to form two sigma bonds and move the double bond in between where the two were to start with. OK, so what are some of the issues you need to think about here? I've drawn just a simple, the simplest possible Diels Alder reaction that we could do. Okay, but it's not the best Diels Alder reaction. Right? What kinds of electronic nature do we need for each of these groups? What's the best combination of diene and dienophile? Yes, we want an electron withdrawing group on the dienophile. So we want the diene to be electron rich. Although most alkyl groups and alkyl substituted dienes are electron rich. Uh, what we really want is an electron withdrawing group on the double bond we're reacting it with. <clears throat> okay, so some examples of that. Uh, we've seen several examples. Anything with a, a carbonyl attached to it, this is an electron withdrawing group. Okay, that makes that, that double bond more reactive. So just in general, uh, then that could encompass a lot of different things. We've seen many examples like cyclic structures where there's two carbonyls. Uh, it could be an ester group, like a methyl ester. Uh, it could be even a cyclic ketone, like that. Could be a nitrile. Um, and any of these groups which have this double bonded oxygen or a double bonded nitrogen even, or triple bonded nitrogen and nitrile, helps this reaction. Uh, and I'm not going to, don't worry about the molecular orbitals and all of that. Um, we're not going to worry about that for the Diels Alder reaction. What you should know, though, is the preferred uh, way, the orientation that these come together, and the stereochemistry of the products. Okay, so when you have an electron withdrawing group like this on your dienophile, it actually prefers to approach the diene in a very specific way, right? Uh, let me just show some examples. So if we have something like oh let's see something like this plus cyclohexenone there are two possible products, right? These products, uh, so this, we form another six-membered ring. So the product is the six-membered ring that's formed in the Diels Alder reaction, but that's attached to another six-membered ring. Okay? And then we have a CH3 group. Now I haven't shown any stereochemistry. So what is the preferred stereochemistry going to be?
Can you, can, do you know what the stoichiometry should be relative to each other? How does it approach? Well, think about this in uh, a three-dimensional model. If I look at the diene side on and I have the CH3 group coming out towards me, okay, and then I have the double bond coming from underneath, where do I want to put the carbonyl? Pointing up? This way? Hmm? Oh, I'm talking about in this transition state, sorry. As they approach, where should that double bond be? Or the double bonded oxygen be? This way? Okay, I'll draw the other one. I could draw it like this. Kind of hard to draw perspective here. Where the bonds are forming there. Okay, which one's preferred? This is exo and this is endo. Exo transition state, endo transition state. That is means the electron in the right drawing group is underneath the dying. Which one's preferred? Endo, that's right. Endo is preferred, so because there's interaction with the CO in this back carbon. So, what does that do then to the position of, say, this carbon bond to oxygen, this bond in the back, and the CH3, relative now in this product structure? Would this this bond be on the same side as the CH3 or opposite sides of the CH3? Opposite? Here's the hydrogen on the carbon. Here's the hydrogen on the group. Are the hydrogens opposite or same? Same side, right? So this hydrogen and this hydrogen are going to be, if, you, if you're looking down on top of the newly formed six-membered ring, those are going to be pointing up, right? So in fact, uh, this hydrogen should be up, and this hydrogen should be up. That means this CH3 is down, and that bond is down. And because we started with a cis double bond, uh, the bond that's forming in the back also is going to be down, okay? So the stereochemistry has all those groups on one side. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, remind you of all of the positions and where they end up. If you really think about how these groups are coming together, the positions relative to each other on a diene versus a dienophile um, let me just uh, erase this. So, okay, if we have those positions on the end of a diene, okay, and we have a dienophile with some electron withdrawing group, at least one electron withdrawing group. Uh, let me just say the other groups on there. Okay, those are going to approach putting the electron withdrawing group underneath the diene. So, uh, what's going to happen is that the EWG and the D are going to be on the same side. All right, And the same thing as the, the 3 and the A. Those are going to be on the same side of the ring when you finish it. Right? And since the electron withdrawing group and 3 are on the same side of the double bond to start with, those are going to be on the same side. All right? 
Everything else is going to be on the opposite side of the electron withdrawing group. So this group, which is pointed in on the diene of, as I've drawn it that way, group B, group C, uh, 1 and 2 on this group, those are all going to be opposite of the electron withdrawing group. All right, so if you can remember that and generalize it that way, you should be able to see any example and just look at the stereochemistry of the, of the double bonds on here and here and see what's on the same side. So pointing out, same side as the electron withdrawing group. Pointing in, opposite sides is the electron withdrawing group. In the most stable, the preferred endo transition state. Okay. Now, exo can be formed too. It's just formed in a minor amount. Okay. It's not the preferred one. Okay. So, sometimes these groups on the diene are pointing out, sometimes pointing in, and you should really look at it that way, especially if it's a ring. If you have our favorite diene, uh, favorite diene, cyclopentadiene, right? This CH2 group is pointed in. It's going to have to be on the opposite side of, of our electron withdrawing group. So if I have this, okay, we would draw the six-numbered ring If we put the electron withdrawing group down, then the CH2 that's bridging here has to be up. Okay? Opposite sides. Notice on cyclopentadiene, the groups pointing out are hydrogen. Those are the groups which are on the same side as the electron withdrawing group. <coughs> okay. uh, let me give one more. Okay, what's the product of that? Well, if I'm always consistent and draw and think about the transition state from a side view, notice I didn't draw the diene in the right conformation, right? In order to react, those two double bonds have to be in the S cis conformation, not, the, not spread out in the S trans conformation. So, let me just erase this here. What I need is uh, let's see. Okay. This one, so if I draw it like this, where are these two methyl groups at? That one and that one. The one on the end should be pointed out or in. The one on the end carbon, this one, should it be pointed out or in? In. So what is the relationship of this CH3 and this group? Cis or trans? Okay, that's not a hard question. Are they cis to each other or trans to each other? Uh, wait, this CH3 and this group here? That's the group I'm talking about here. So they're going to be trans, so that CH3 has to be pointed out. Okay? 
Yeah, I mean, really be careful that you can visualize those and know what that structure is in the right conformation. This CH3 actually is here. It won't matter much. Okay, now this group, I like to draw this again with the electron withdrawing group pointed underneath. Okay, and that puts a CH3 group there and a CH3 group there. And as these bonds come together, all right, the electron withdrawing group is going to be on the same side as the out group. Okay, so when I, when I draw the product, I draw a six-membered ring. I put the double bond here. That's, it ends up in the middle of between those two starting double bonds. All right. I draw the electron withdrawing group down. <clears throat> I'm running out of room. Okay. That means this CH3 group has to be down. Right? What about what about the CH3 group on the left here? Where is that? Actually, I haven't shown a lot of examples like this, but that CH3 group ends up here. The fact is that carbon stays as an sp2 carbon in the product, so there is no up or down there. The, any, any positions on the back of the diene are still sp2. Uh, but I've got to do this CH3 group and this CH3 group. Okay, So on the dienophile, I have a CH3 group on the same carbon as that group, so that has to be up. And this one will be up or down. Hmm? Up or down. Up. It has to be up, right. It's on the same side as this one. If that one's up, this one has to be up. Okay, so that's the product. With everything all together. All right. Uh, is anybody still confused about the deals alder? Let me ask a question about deals alder in a slightly different way. Uh, let's say I have this product. Uh, what did we start with? What diene and what dienophile did we start with? I'll draw it flat also just to show you how it looks flat. That's how I would draw it in, the, in this sort of flat way. Showing bold and dashed. Okay, what's the diene that we started with? <coughs> yeah, think about where the six-membered ring is and the bonds that would have been formed. So here's the double bond in the product. That double bond is in between where the two double bonds started with of the diene. Okay? So that means they would have been here and here. Okay? And this bond and this bond are the ones that were formed. So the dienophile would have had a double bond there. So the starting material has to look like this. Ooh, terrible oxygen. And the dienophile had to look like that.
Okay. Yeah, if you still have trouble seeing that, I would uh, go back and look at more of the problems uh, for deals all their reactions. Okay, um, I, that really is that, the conjugated dienes, allylic positions, um, stability, free radical, halogenation in those allylic positions. That really is the bulk of what Chapter 10 is. So if you have any questions um, about anything else in Chapter 10 or this, yes, no? Okay, <coughs> Chapter 11. Aromaticity. Uh, aromatic compounds. We talked a lot about how having very specific structural features allow us to have special stability, right? Benzene is an aromatic compound and is more stable than a conjugated triene should be. And there are three things we need to have for aromatic stability. What are those? Fully conjugated. Uh, planar is, yes. Uh, if it's conjugated, it has to be planar. Okay. And that for the pi electrons, there has to be 4n plus 2 number of electrons. n is any integer. So there's one more thing we have to have. Well, there are, yeah, that's what fully conjugated is. All sp2 all aligned in one plane. A ring. It has to be a ring. Right? That's important. It has to be a ring. If it's just a uh, triene, that doesn't get that special aromatic stability. So, um, uh, for that reason, a number of things, a number of structures show aromatic stability. And some show uh, great instability because they're not aromatic or anti-aromatic. Uh, and again, don't worry if you don't know all the details of molecular orbitals. I'm not going to ask you questions about molecular orbitals. Uh, but if you remember these things, you should be able to determine which molecules are aromatic and which aren't. Uh, and keep in mind, if we have atoms other than carbon in the ring, heteroatoms, we need to consider the, uh, if they have lone pairs, whether or not those lone pairs are in conjugation with the rest of the system or not in conjugation. Okay, and that depends on, uh, the easiest way is to look to see if it already has a double bond to it, then it should be, um, uh, the lone pair is not in conjugation. It has to be orthogonal. So I think one of the ones I gave on the quiz, I think I gave this on the quiz, didn't I? This molecule, this molecule, it's called oxazole. It has uh, five atoms in a ring, and if we look at these atoms, we have two lone pairs on oxygen, one on the nitrogen. So is that an aromatic compound? I hear, I see someone shaking his head, and I hear someone whisper yes. It is aromatic. It's absolutely aromatic, and, but you have to consider uh, how this is aromatic. So if we take a look at this, we have a carbon here, a carbon here, a nitrogen here, and a carbon here that all has pi bonds to it written like it is. So that's four electrons in the pi system. That means these electrons, since the nitrogen has this double bond, these electrons are not in the system. Okay? They can't be. Nitrogen already has a p orbital because it has a double bond. The other, other orbital would be 90 degrees apart from that. 
So that's four electrons in those two double bonds. And then we have an oxygen with two lone pairs. Yes, this atom has a lone pair available to be in the same plane. So that's a total of six electrons. Okay, so that fits with everything we need to be aromatic. We have a conjugated system. If that lone pair is participating in resonance, then it must be also in a p orbital. Um, and so we have a p orbital on every atom, six electrons, and it's perfectly happy that way. Okay. Uh, there was another one I had, I think. Uh, what about that one? Would that be aromatic? Again, each of these oxygens has two lone pairs. Okay, potentially those lone pairs are adjacent to a double bond, so they could be delocalized, right? If we were to get a fully conjugated system, how many electrons would we have here? Eight, that's right. We'd have two electrons in that double bond, two electrons in that double bond, and then we'd have to participate a lone pair from each. So that's a total of eight electrons in order to be conjugated fully so it would not be aromatic. Okay? It doesn't fit 4n plus 2. Right? If you leave that out, Okay, then you no longer have anything on that oxygen to participate in the pi system. So if you even tried to do six electrons, you couldn't get it fully conjugated. See how that works? The same thing is true when we have uh, carbons that have a plus charge or a minus charge. It either has an empty orbital, which is a p orbital, or it could have a lone pair, which is a carbanion. Those can have... Uh, possibilities for being aromatic. So if you look at something like, uh, let's see, something like this. Now if we want to get a p orbital on that carbon, okay, would we want a lone pair, or would we want a carbocation in order to delocalize and be aromatic? In order to make that aromatic, what, what do we need in a p orbital on that carbon? A carbocation, right, because we already have six electrons. If we put a lone pair, it would be too many electrons. If we have cyclo pentadiene, we have one carbon here that doesn't have a double bond. In order to become a, a conjugated aromatic compound, we would need to have a minus charge. Because we have four electrons in those double bonds, we need two more electrons. Okay, so that would be the aromatic of cyclopentadiene. Uh, what else about aromaticity? Okay, so hopefully you can recognize what are aromatic compounds, what aren't aromatic compounds. Again, a ring system fully conjugated with 4n plus 2 numbers of electrons in the pi system. Now, having aromatic rings like benzene uh, gives rise to a specific kind of reactivity. We'll talk about the substitution chemistry in a minute, but uh, if we talk about the reaction of this group towards other things, and particularly substituents on the benzene ring, uh, what kinds of things uh, can we do? So one of the things that is difficult to do, I'm just going to put a substituent here. One of the things that's difficult to do is to add hydrogen. Okay. 
How do you know how to do hydrogenation of a double bond? What what conditions do you know? Right, a metal catalyst and a source of hydrogen. The important thing here is that um, the metal catalyst, the typical ones that we hydrogenate double bonds with, won't react with benzene. So we need to have, uh, I would just say, very strong forcing conditions and very reactive metal catalysts. So rhodium, uh, actually platinum, I think even some nickel at very high pressures and temperatures. That says temperature, sorry. Okay, only under very forcing conditions. So if you just see the typical hydrogen with palladium on carbon, it won't touch it. All right, we do have another way to reduce it. Uh, but not all the way. What we can do is use sodium metal in, in methanol. I'm sorry, sodium ammonia in methanol. The sodium and ammonia part is the real important one. And this gets us to reducing only part of it. So we can get to this non-conjugated dyne. That just goes by electron transfers sequentially. Uh, if you recall, this was called the Birch reduction. Birch reduction. Okay, so there's um, not a lot we can do with the pi bonds in the ring in terms of reducing them, except under forcing conditions or very strong electron transfer conditions. But we can do a lot of things to the side chains. Um, we know that alkyl substituted benzene, so if I take toluene here uh, and do reactions with it, there's a lot of things we can do. Okay, the allylic halogen, I'm sorry, benzylic halogenation, Br2 or NBS with peroxides or light. That will give us free radical <coughs> bromination. Just like we I showed you with the allylic positions, these benzylic positions are also the same kind of reactivity for that. Okay, we can do oxidation. So if I treat toluene with, uh, let's see, your book used what? Sodium dichromate? Under acidic conditions. Okay, what does that do? Acid. You get benzoic acid. And not just from toluene. We get benzoic acid even if there are other carbons. It, there has to be at least one hydrogen on there, and then you can oxidize it and break all the other carbon bonds. Uh, so not just CH3. Any alkyl group that has at least one hydrogen on it can be oxidized. Okay, what about... Let me just say this one. If I take that and do typical alkene chemistry with it, what if I add HCl? What product do we get? A mixture or a selective reaction? Selective reaction, uh, because you will form the carbocation, if you add the hydrogen, you'll form the carbocation at the benzylic position, and so that's where you'll add the chlorine. Okay. Even though both are secondary, one is secondary and benzylic, so the product will be that. Yes? On your first one on top, when we have the Br2, yep. would it be possible for the bromine to add the same carbon as the methyl? 
Uh, what do you mean? Let's not branch out with the uh, methyl. We'll be branching off of the... Off here? Yeah. Uh, no, that would require breaking the aromatic ring. Um, and, by the way, when we get to talk about it, uh, if you did the reaction under conditions of... Oops, where's my eraser? Under conditions with a Lewis acid... Okay, so if you have this, and you do Br2 and FeBr3, where does it, where does it, what does it substitute for? It'll substitute for a hydrogen. It doesn't react on the carbon that that adds to. I'll just draw the para product. So you'll get that. You might ask, well, why doesn't it add to the carbon that has the methyl group on it? Well, let's take a look at that. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to erase that. Uh, okay, so if you had this, even if you had a very reactive electrophile, like Br plus generated from the Br2 and FeBr3, Remember what the intermediate looks like. I'm just going to add it to that. That will give that. Okay. If it adds there, the only, you can't get back to an aromatic compound because there's no proton to eliminate. Okay. You'd have to break off the CH3, and that's not really possible. Okay. The only only thing you can do is add ortho or para to it. So actually, this if that forms, it would just reverse. Instead, you'll form ortho or para, a carbon that has a hydrogen on it. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. That's chapter 12. So that you can deprotonate and lose a hydrogen. Oops, sorry, that's meta. Well... Meta will be formed in a little bit. Okay, so you can only substitute hydrogens under electrophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, the conditions I had before were free radical conditions. So as radical halogenation, that's why it substituted one of the hydrogens on the benzylic position. So the conditions matter. Instead of this, you had light or peroxides. Those both generate free radicals. <coughs> Remember that free radicals are doing alkyl substitution. Okay. Um, what else can we do with substituents on a benzene ring? We can oxidize it. We can also take these kinds of substituents and reduce it. So if we have an acyl group, okay, if you have an acyl group, you can reduce that off with uh, zinc amalgam under acidic conditions. rule we talked about heterocycles we've seen a little bit uh, anything else in chapter 11 that you have questions about if you still have trouble with resonance structures you should practice 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 because all of this aromatic chemistry and diene chemistry is all about understanding Resonance. Uh, sure. Um, well, let's do that in the context of this um, electrophilic substitution chemistry from Chapter 12. Electrophilic 
aromatic substitution. Okay? Um, we know that we can take a benzene ring, react it with an electrophile, and that electrophile can be many things. It can be halogens, it can be a friedel crafts alkylation, so it can be a carbon electrophile, it can be an acyl, friedel crafts acylation, it can be a nitro group, an NO2+, plus. it can be a sulfonic acid group, so SO3H+, plus is the electrophile. Um, they all react with the exact same mechanism, right? They react by reacting with one of the double bonds first, on a carbon that has hydrogen, as I just talked about with that bromine. Okay. So I'll highlight that. That leaves a plus charge adjacent to it. Okay. This is a common mistake I see is people add the electrophile and they might draw something like this. And put the plus charge there. Okay, I see that commonly mistake. Remember, look where your plus charge goes. If you take the electrons from this double bond, give it to an electrophile, and form a bond to that carbon, it's got to be the adjacent carbon that's left empty. Okay, so I don't want to see this at all. You've been warned. Okay, now that plus charge is, is in resonance throughout the ring. So again, we have an, this, if you think about this group here, Right? Oh, shoot. I need, that's my eraser. If you think about this group here, just that part, that's like an allyl cation, right? An allyl cation. If you take these electrons and shift it over, that puts the double bond to the right, leaving the carbon that the electrons are flowing away from empty. So a resonance structure for this would be now with the double bond here and the plus charge here. And then everything else is in the same place. Okay. Well, that could certainly go back. That's why it's a resonance structure, right? You could e easily imagine those electrons flowing back. Remember, all these structures just represent what's going on of something that's spread out in between. You could take this electrons here and move them down there. Draw another resonance structure because that looks like an allylic cation as well, right? That double bond's there, the new double bond's there, the plus charge is here, electrophile, hydrogen. Ultimately, what we have is something which actually, uh, should I keep running out of room here. I'm drawing too large. If you think about it, what actually exists is better, maybe better represented like that, right? Sometimes we talk about it like that. We just, the dotted line just means that the plus charge is delocalized. But it's important to recognize these resonance structures because it says that plus charge is on that carbon, that carbon, and that carbon. Okay? That's critical to know that. Ultimately, in the end, the proton has to come off. The proton on the carbon that was made sp3 by the addition of your electrophile, and the electrons have to go back to satisfy that plus charge and reform the third double bond. Okay, you could draw it from this resonance form here, uh, maybe a little bit easier. Uh, you could easily see it from this resonance form here. So the hydrogen is coming off, the electrons go down to the ring. Okay, that mechanism is true for all electrophilic aromatic substitution regardless of what E plus is. Okay, now one thing else to note on this structure, let me just 
erase some of these things I put here. Uh, clean these up. So we have these resonance structures. Oops, I'll put this here. Look at where those plus charges are on those three carbons here, here, and here in these individual resonance forms. Okay. If we have other groups on the benzene ring, if they're on the carbons where the plus charge ends up, guess what? That could be either good or bad. All right. Let's say I have a group uh, here. Okay. Depending on the nature of R, if you put the plus charge next to it, it's going to be very good. What's good? What do we want there to make it more stable? Huh? Electron donating. electron donating group, EDG, electron donating group, right? We have a plus charge. We want to stabilize that plus charge by giving it some electron density. That lowers its energy. If it's an electron withdrawing group, and, the, and we, the resonance forms put the plus charge next to that, it's going to raise the energy or destabilize it. Okay, and that's going to be bad. All right, so those are the fundamentals of this mechanism, and if you can remember those things, every specific example you look at, you can analyze and see what's going to be good and what's going to be bad, and it, you can predict which way it will go. Okay, so when we talk about relative positions, we have electron donating groups, anything that's, well, alkyl, if it's carbon, alkyl is a donating group, just through the sigma bond, it's a weak donating group, but it's a donating group, it makes the benzene ring more reactive, and it um, stabilizes that plus charge. So if we want the plus charge to end up next to it, the electrophile adds ortho or para ortho or para to donating groups. Donors, okay? If we have an electron withdrawing group, that's anything that has a uh, carbonyl or a, some kind of a double bonded oxygen or nitrogen, that helps to withdraw, or a sulfur oxygen double bond or a nitro group. Let's take a look at nitro group. I'm gonna erase all of this and draw the resonance forms for addition to a nitro group, I think. Right, and remember, if we draw out the Lewis structure for nitro, it shows that there's a plus charge right there on the nitrogen. Okay, so if you add a substituent in the ortho or para position, I'll just draw the ortho. So your E plus reacts. Okay, look at that. That's very, very bad. Right? And I could draw all the other resonance forms too. The difference would be that we would have the plus charge here, the plus charge here, and the plus charge there. Okay. So if I uh, react para, I'll also get the plus charges in the same places. If I react meta, That puts it here. That will put the plus charge here. Okay. Then if I draw all the resonance structures for that, plus charge there, plus charge there, and plus charge there. Okay. Skips every carbon, right, as you draw the resonance forms. So that doesn't have a particularly bad situation. Okay. This is the meta meta, and this is uh, ortho, or para.
Okay, so again, it's important to recognize the resonance forms. Know where that plus charge is and uh, look at the two possibilities, ortho, para, or meta, um, <coughs> and know where it should go. By the way, in most cases, you get more of the para because of steric reasons. It's less crowded than ortho positions. If it's an ortho para director, this group um, takes over sometimes and uh, directs. Uh, oops, that should be electrophile. Directs um, nitro definitely directs meta. So if we think about electron withdrawing groups, nitro is one of the strongest. Sulfonic acids. Those are meta directors. Um, acyl groups. If you have an acyl group attached to your benzene ring, those are meta directors. Uh, what else do we have? Nitriles. Those are meta directors. Anything like that. Obviously, that are uh, withdrawing electron density away from the ring. Okay? The one exception are halogens. Although they are electron withdrawing to some extent, their lone pairs donate to affect the ortho para selectivity. Okay? So halogens are the exception, although it's slightly less reactive than benzene because it is an electron withdrawing group. It's an ortho para director. All right? It has a lone pair to donate, so that's why you're going to see yeah, and that's because if you take a look at, let me just erase this. So if I take that NO2 group out and put bromine here, if that were a bromine and we put the plus charge on it, the, the inductive withdrawing effect of that sigma bond is overcome by the ability of the lone pair to stabilize and donate. Okay, so you can actually draw it with a double bond to the bromine and put the plus on bromine. So that one's at that fine balance where this is a little bit better than for directing ability than the withdrawing. Um, okay, let me uh, take a look at those uh, the problems I left you with on Friday. I think I have it. Yes. Okay. Now, now knowing all of that, if you take a look at these three. Uh, steps in this reaction, you should be able to predict what the stere what the regiochemistry outcome, where the groups will all be relative to each other in the final product. So we're doing three things here. We're doing a friedel crafts alkylation in this first step, a friedel crafts acylation in the second step, and a bromination in the third step. All right? So we're putting on a CH3 group, we're putting on an acetate group, and we're putting on a bromine. What is the relative positions of all these groups in the product? Well, do it one step at a time. Take a look at what happens when we do the first step. Okay, the first step, we're going to put on a CH3 group. So you're going to substitute a hydrogen for a CH3. Pick any position, it doesn't matter since we're just starting anywhere with benzene. I just put it on the top because it's easiest. All right, that's after the first step. Now we do the second step. We're putting on this group, okay? Is it gonna be meta? or para. And just for the sake of all this, just assume that para is going to be the major one over ortho. So what kind of effect does the CH3 group have? Ortho para director. So you would expect maybe as the major product CH3 here and acyl group there, as the major product. Okay. From there, we're going to do a third reaction, and what are we doing? Bromination. 
where does where do the both of these groups now uh, could be fighting each other or could be working together? We just said that the CH3 is an ortho para group. It, the ortho's already taken. I'm sorry, the para's already taken. So it'll direct the next group there. All right. Ortho. This is a meta director, right? Because it's an electron withdrawing group. So meta to it. Meta to it. So that's going to direct groups either here or here. Look at that. They're working together. That's a good thing. So the product would be bromine, acyl, that. Okay? Yes? You can, yeah, no problem. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do that from now on because it's easier. Yes? I have a question. So if, if the second step, or that, if that very last step is in excess, would you get a bromination on the other side? Uh, you could force it, yeah. You could. The more reactive the benzene ring is, the easier that's to do. But since we have now an electron withdrawing group on here, that makes it a little less reactive. Uh, okay, well, what if we switch these steps up? Can you explain the part with the blue pen? Ah, the part with the blue pen. So well, all I'm saying is that um, if we just look at this group, if that group alone would direct the next group to come in meta to it, and that meta to it would be one, two, three, would be that position, okay? The CH3 group would direct groups to come in ortho or para to it. The para position is blocked, the ortho. So they're both, um, if, if you would just had one or the other, those would be the positions that would direct to. They're both working together. So that's how you think about that. Um, let's look at another, let's just mix this up. What if we do uh, acylation first? As the first step. Do step two as the first step. We would get an acyl group. Oh, sorry, running out of room. Okay. That's a meta director. Now we do step one. Okay. And that'll put the CH3 group meta to it. Okay. Since this is directing groups to that position or that position, it's symmetric. Okay. That's where the CH3 goes. Now you do bromination. Where does it go? Not so easy, is it? Here they're fighting with each other. So if you just think about this group on top, it wants to direct things to the meta position. That's the only open meta position to it. Okay. The CH3 group, on the other hand, maybe if I use a different color, it might be easier. Let's use green. The CH3 group can direct ortho to it. So those are two ortho positions. Or para, there's the para to it. So the CH3 group directs differently. So usually, usually, the electron donating group wins out if it's a strong electron donating group versus a weak uh, withdrawing group. In this case, CH3 is a weak donating group because it's not a direct resonance donor. The Carbonyl is a pretty good electron withdrawing group. So I would suspect the carbonyl would probably win here, although it might be less selective. They're fighting with each other. Uh, but the major product is most likely going to be 
that one. Okay. This one we just have to remember which one's stronger than. Yeah, that one's a little gray area. Well, so you should know for donors, alkyl is the weakest. The stronger donors are the something with an oxygen or a nitrogen lone pair to donate. Those are strong. Those will always take over. Yes? If it's a strong donating group, it would go to uh, the least hindered position. <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, my guess is it would probably go here or here, but not here. That would be a little more hindered. Um, so a case where it might be a little more uh, straightforward, let's say we had, let me just give some examples here. Okay, I'm going to erase. Is that okay? Let's say I had that. Did I give that example in class? Maybe. Let's say I had that. Uh, and I do nitration. Where does the nitro group go? The methyl group is, is uh, wanting this to be ortho para, so it's directing to those groups. The oxygen is also an ortho para director. Para 2 it's blocked by the methyl, so it's directing to those two positions. Now we have two donors that are fighting with each other for directing the next group in. Which one wins? The OH. The OH, that's right. Residence donation is always stronger. The OH will win, and you'll get the group coming ortho to it. So that would be the major product. Okay. If you have an electron withdrawing group, an electron donating group, uh, and they're both strong, the donating group will win. Uh, let me give an example. So, question. Yes. Um, even though two substituents would be working together in empty position, ones with more positions available is more reactive. Uh, the one with more positions available, not necessarily. So it depends on the um, substituents. Yes. The first criteria is going to be how strong of a donor or withdrawer is it. Okay, and then you look at the least hindered position. And so you have to just evaluate each, each case. So I have a question. Yep. Now, with that product that we have now, if we're going to say an to that, that now with the, you want to put a fourth group on? Okay, you're, you're, you're yeah, all right, let's go for it. Okay, well, that's a good question. Let's take a look at this. Oxygen will donate here. That's the only position open that it's um, directing to. The CH3 would do here or here. Where would the nitro group prefer it? Okay, guess what's going to win? Right there. So in essence, all three of those groups would be working together. Well, the CH3 isn't. But the OH is The OH and the nitro group are actually working together here. They would prefer it in the same place. So, yeah. Um, okay. Anything else about this? I think I pretty much covered everything. Uh, again, that's up through 12.16. Um, did you see I did post some uh, uh, problems for these that I pulled from the 342 page last time? We can take a look at those. Uh, let me get rid of this. Stop. That's not it. Okay.
soon I lost my control. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these. Um, come on. Okay, which which position on these rings? would the uh, electrophilic substitution take place? So this is the exact same type of problem we've just been looking at. What are the directing group abilities for these groups? So here we have, a first one, we have a chlorine and a nitro group. So chlorine is what kind of director? Ortho para. Para to it is blocked, so it'll direct to this position. Okay, the nitro group is a meta director. Meta to it. So it's controlling groups to come in here. So they're working together. Those happen to be symmetric, so it's nice and easy. One of those sides will be substituted in an electrophilic substitution. Okay, here's chlorine. It's directing here and here. Here's oxygen. It's directing here and here. Chlorine, oxygen, who's going to win? The oxygen is the strongest donor. Chlorine actually, remember, is a deactivator. It's going to be a weaker effect. It still directs orthopera, but it's in between. So oxygen will win, and it'll be in one of these positions. Okay. Here's a, an acyl group and an oxygen. Oxygen will direct here, here, and here. Ortho and para. The carbonyl is what kind of directing group? Meta. So meta to it would be this position, which is blocked, or this position. Okay. They're fighting. Who's going to win? What did I just say? Which one wins when you have this choice? Deactivator or activator? It's going to be the electron donating group. This group will win. Now, the exact position? Um, that's a good question. I would say one of these. <laughs> did I say one place? I'd give you credit for either one. Okay. Aromaticity. Which ones are aromatic? Which ones aren't aromatic? What's aromatic? Here's uh, cyclobutadiene. Yes or no? No, it only has four electrons. This is called thiophene. aromatic or not? Sulfur is in the same uh, column as oxygen on the periodic table. Yes. Yeah, you choose one of those lone pairs from sulfur, six pi electrons, it works. Uh, Compare that now. We have a five-membered ring with six pi electrons. Here's another five-membered ring. Aromatic or not? No, not with a plus charge. It's only four electrons. Uh, two, three, four. This is an eight-membered ring <clears throat> with three double bonds and two plus charges. It's a ring. Is it fully conjugated? Yes, and how many electrons? Six. Yep, so that's aromatic. All right, what about this one? Yes, the lone pairs, since the nitrogens already have double bonds to them, right, those lone pairs can't be in resonance. So it's six electrons. It looks just like benzene, except two of the carbons are nitrogen. 
All right, that's easy enough. Now that big eight member ring, um, we, we, for some of those different looking ones, I, I, I see, I have a little bit of trouble seeing. Um, in what way? In that, uh, if you add the plus charge yep. on, onto this one. The important things to look at. Every carbon has the potential to have a p orbital on it. A plus charge is a p orbital. Okay, it's a ring. It's fully conjugated, and then add up the number of electrons. It has four n plus two electrons. Then it should be aromatic. So in the, in the, in the state that it's in right now, it is fully conjugated. Yep, those p, those uh, carbocations are p orbitals. Okay. So six electrons. Six electrons total in a fully conjugated ring system. Okay. Yeah. Now it's not as stable as benzene because it's a dication, but it still gets aromatic stability relative to not having that uh, aromatic system. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, okay, here's a conjugated diene addition. I think I just did this before, right? With HCl uh, at the beginning. If you add HCl, what? What the other book talked about is the 1 2 product and 1 4 product. Would be addition across one double bond versus addition across two double bonds. So the 1 2 product would have the hydrogen add here and the Cl add there, not the Cl on the end. Even though it's adding across one double bond, that carbocation is still the most stable. So what does the 1 4 product look like? If that initial hydrogen added here, and you initially had a carbocation at that carbon, where else can the carbocation be? Should I draw it? Okay, that's the intermediate. That's where we added the chlorine to get this product. Where would we add chloride? Where else could we add chloride? Bottom the bottom carbon. And the double bond then has to be here. Okay. Know your resonance structures. Oh, good. Resonance structures. Look at that. Okay, brobination of nitrobenzene. Uh, I've added it to this carbon. That puts the plus charge here, right? What are the other resonance forms? Plus charge there. Plus charge there, right? Here I've added it to this metacarbon. We can draw the resonance forms. Plus charge there. And then plus charge there. Which is better? Which is worse? <coughs> the, the bottom one is better. Okay. Why? Nitro group is electron withdrawing and plus charge is next to the electron withdrawing group. That's destabilized. If it were an OH instead, it'd be the opposite. All right? Uh, okay. I think I had some examples of dying. Yes, here we go. Who's tried to do these yet? Okay, this is a, these are examples of the Diels-Alder cycloaddition product and thinking backwards to see what is the diene that you start with and what is the dienophile. So take a look at this. Um, in this case, in the first case, right, 
Look where the double bond is. That's the middle of where the diene used to be. So the diene had to have been here and here. Right? So that means the bonds at the ends of, the, of that diene are the ones that were formed to make the ring. And that means the <coughs> dienophile had to have the double bond there. Okay? So let's take a look at this. This part of the molecule, those CH3 groups are both up. So the way I look at that transition state, if they're up, they must have been pointed in or out. Were they pointed in or out? Were they both pointed in the same direction? They're both on the same <coughs> side, so they must have been both out. Okay, so the CH3 groups should have been, this is a trans double bond and that's a trans double bond. Okay, the dienophile has our electron withdrawing group down and a CH3 group up. So there must have been a double bond where the electron withdrawing group is on there. Now, relative to the CH3 group, would they have been cis or trans? Trans. They're trans in the product. That means on the double bond, they had to have been trans to each other. Okay, see how that works? Here's another one. We have nitrile, we have CH3. And we have this bridge, it's a two carbon bridge. Notice the double bond in the product. And that means the original double bond had to have been here and here. And those bonds were the form. Notice the electron withdrawing group was on the dienophile, so that double bond is there. So break the molecule like that. What did we start with? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. The dienophile was a six-membered ring. Now I've shown lots of examples with a five-membered ring. This is exactly the same thing, except now there's two carbons in between instead of one. That's all. That's what that is. Okay. The dienophile has to be the cis isomer because they both end up on the same side. So it has to be that. Okay, anybody having trouble seeing how I get that? Oh, the last one I already did for you, didn't I? Earlier. So notice again, here's the double bond. The original diene had to have been here. The original dienophile had to have been there. It just happens that there's an oxygen bridging it instead of a carbon. All right. Questions on dienes, dienophiles? Boy, time's going fast, isn't it? Okay. Activating, deactivating groups. Lots of reactions that we've covered. Elimination, addition, deals alder, reduction, so on and so on. Okay, uh, that's pretty much chapter 10, 11, and 12. Did you want me to go over any of the other material? Or are you getting all tired out? Um, if you looked at the old exam, you'll notice there's lots of NMR spectroscopy on it and uh, infrared spectroscopy, which we didn't cover this year. That's in 342 now. Uh, so you've got to weed through it and ignore it all. But remember, all the chemistry we talked about with alkynes and alkenes 
SN2, SN1 substitution reactions, E1, E2 elimination reactions, all of that you should uh, brush up on, particularly reactions, reactions, reactions. If you had trouble with reactions before, you should definitely go back and study reactions. Um, so if you think about reactions of alkynes, Right Here are several of the types of reactions that uh, we can do with alkynes. This one on the left is ozonolysis. What does that do with an alkyne? Breaks it apart and makes two carboxylic acids. So one of them is going to be three carbons. And the other one is going to be two carbons. Okay. Addition of bromine. Adds the cross the triple bond. Leaves a double bond behind. What's the stereochemistry? It's got to be trans, right? If we have more than one equivalent, if you have excess, you're going to add two. You're going to add across the, the double bond also. So in this case with chlorine, you're going to end up with four chlorines on there. All right. We have two reductions. Hydrogenation will give what product? Alkane. Count your carbons. If you miss all the carbons there, you'll be in trouble. And lithium and ammonia will give the trans alkene. And if you want the cis alkene, yes, H2 and Lindlar's catalyst. Uh, I don't think I have in here. Um, Maybe I do. All right, reactions of alkenes. Some of these were not. Uh... Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, focusing on alkynes again. Notice uh, this was for uh, chemistry that we haven't talked about this year. But this is sodium amide. What does that do? E protonate the acetylene, and then we do SN2 substitution. So we add two carbons, and then reduce it. To the cis double bond. Okay. Alcohols. We can do a lot of things with alcohols, right? We can uh, dehydrate with under acidic conditions. Um, that's an E1 elimination usually. We can convert it to a bromine. Okay, what's the stereochemistry of this? Up or down? We start with stereochemistry of the alcohol. The bromine goes with BBr3 goes with retention or inversion of the stereochemistry? Inversion. Inversion. That's down. Okay. These conditions. Strong base. Elimination. You haven't learned that yet, or that yet. Uh, sodium cyanide in an aprotic polar solvent does substitution, right? SN2 substitution.
See, you go back and you look at uh, how easy all this stuff was, right? Have you gone back to read chapter one again? <laughs> this is an orbital. These are electrons. Uh, double bonds. Actually, there's a lot of stuff here you didn't know either. <laughs> that one you wouldn't know. Uh, hydroboration, we did it a different way. We haven't talked about that. HBr you can do NBs in water, bromine Br plus in water, bromohydrin. I think you had that on one of the tests too. All the way. Um, okay, I think uh, I think you're getting tired. I just want to talk about just a couple more things. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but please go back and look at your issues of confirmations and stability. Remember we talked a lot about um, eclipsing interactions and staggered in butane conformations, cyclohexane chair conformations, uh, positions of groups. Know your issues of stereochemistry and elimination chemistry, E2, right? You need anti-periplanar or anti-coplanar. Um, what else did we talk about? Uh, SN2 substitution, SN1 carbocations, carbocation rearrangements. Everything comes down to structure because structure dictates reactivity. Okay, electron withdrawing groups, electron donating groups.